I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Credit Ferry. So we are an alternative or an online lender that offers uh, a fair, more affordable alternative to payday loans and other high interest uh, installment loans that can be found online or on your local store corner. Um, I've used three different law firms, not because I've shopped law firms, just because of expertise that they had and um, in different states that we've needed to, to do business. Um, so I've used one law firm for business um, creation, um, getting licensed with the state, um, both as a business and also to be a lender. Um, articles and corporation, operating agreement, all that stuff, um, fundraising, um, we've used one law firm for that. Uh, I've used another law firm for um, sort of financial services specific things like our loan agreement, our ACH authorization form, our terms of service on our website, uh, our privacy policy, making sure that we're all buttoned up there. Um, and then we will be using different law firms as we move into different states to um, get licensed in those states. I have to be licensed in each state to actually win. Um, so we deal a lot with lawyers. That's it, you? I hope. Okay, so I'm Jennifer Williams. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of a company called Cuddle Clones. Uh, we make stuffed animals that look like your pet. Uh, so they are custom. Uh, we also have several other products that we offer, but it, we're in the pet industry. Uh, we were a company that started out of the entrepreneurship MBA program at U of L. So um, my business partner and I met there. That was back in 2009 to 2011. We were in the program, and then we officially launched all of our stuff in 2013. So we're about almost four years old. Uh, so we've used a lot of lawyers for different things. Uh, they're all very different. Uh, initially, um, these are kind of like in chronological order. Um, I did not use a law firm to set up an LLC. I have like, I don't know, eight LLCs, so I'm used to doing it, so I just know how to do it. Pay the 40 bucks, I don't have to pay a lawyer for that. <laughs> um, but the first things we did was trademark stuff. So we had a US trademark made, and then we also got a China trademark. Um, our workshop is in China, uh, but it is a wholly foreign-owned enterprise. So we ended up using a law firm in Beijing to set up that whoopee, pun intended. <laughs> Um, and then we also used the Chinese law firm to develop an employment agreement for the head of operations of our workshop. So those were sort of China specific. Um, I will say the law firms here in Louisville don't really have a lot of Asian experience. I mean, we use Frostbound Todd for some stuff and they'll have like some symposiums sometimes and I'll go listen to those, but typically that's run out of their Cincinnati office. So, you know, I kind of tend to, if, it, if the documents need to be in the Chinese language, I typically are using a Chinese law firm and then I have them translate it for me. Um, we did a fundraising event in 2013. So we used a law firm for what's called the PPM, uh, the Private Placement Memorandum for our Series A investment. Um, and then they took care of some filings for uh, certain non-accredited investors that were from out of state. So there were some additional uh, requirements there. We had a law firm draft an incentive agreement for some of our um, incentive shares. We actually went after a vendor uh, a couple years back who did not do a good job for us, and so we, it wasn't necessarily suing them, but sent them a letter and did um, some back and forth and ended up settling for some money that we got back, so we've used them for that. Uh, last year we did an acquisition of a company, so we did the whole mergers and acquisitions section of the law firm there, so I get to meet everyone at the law firm. <laughs> um, we had a very young shareholder pass away this last year, and so I had no idea what to do with his shares because our operating agreement didn't really discuss that, so we had to use a law firm to um, figure out what to do there and what to offer his estate the executors of his will. We, on a side thing, I used uh, them for a real estate deal. Cuddle Clones was gonna buy a building, but we ended up not uh, buying it, but we used them to kind of put together the um, real estate, the, their whole arm of law firms that do real estate laws. And then the last thing is we have done some things with um, trademark infringements. The little company we bought last year is called Cartoonize My Pet. 
and you can make a custom cartoon of your pet and then put it on a bunch of products that are manufactured by Zazzle, uh, which is all fine, but we have all of these groups that try to create products out of our art and sell them. So there's a store on Amazon that is, says cartoonize my pet store, it's not ours. <laughs> so we have kind of sent them to cease and desist letter, like those types of things that we work with the law firm to, to develop. That's it. Um, I'm Trey Riddle and uh, my company is called Sunstrand. I'm the CEO and, and founder of that. Uh, Sunstrand is really a, a materials company, so we manufacture materials or uh, natural materials. We call them biomaterials. Uh, we generally sell to upstream manufacturers, so we're pretty low in the supply chain. We don't really sell to end users, um, but you would use them in a variety of things from uh, automotive applications to building materials, consumer goods, sporting goods use them in polymers and plastics like glass or carbon fiber, uh, in filtration applications, um, in, uh, in wastewater management applications. So a bunch of different, bunch of different applications were kind of a platform in that sense. Um, it, our experience with, well, after I started a business, I realized I should have either been an accountant or a lawyer. Because <laughs> um, apparently that's where all the money goes. <laughs> um, but, um, I would say that in many cases, I, you know, almost had to work hand in hand with the two on a lot of concepts. Uh, but our experience with lawyers have been, you know, the traditional lineage of we did use a lawyer to form a company. That was one place where we had a lot of back and forth with our accountants and lawyers to be sure we chose the right type of company because that's not just a legal consideration. Obviously, that's an accounting consideration also. Um, and then we sort of gravitated to um, support for trademark. Uh, we did patent searches. We haven't filed a patent. We've just kept our stuff trade secret, but we definitely did do patent searches around our technologies to see what that landscape looks like. We do have the trade trademarks. Uh, I think it's a worldwide trademark, actually. Um, and um, employee agreements, uh, that was another thing we did in our initial phases were to get that stuff on lockdown because we have um, you know, a fair amount of confidentiality language around that and, you know, um, non-compete type language. Uh, something that we regularly do with the attorney is, is NDAs and, and uh, where it seems like that's a regular expense every month, you know, because I don't ever sign an NDA without having my attorney read it, even though he tells me every time, you only need to look for these three things, Trey, and I said, that's fine. You look for those three things, that's your job. Uh, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll continue to send them your way. And, um, and we did have a, we did have a, fairly complex acquisition of a facility in our plant here but it was associated with a, it was a former plant that was shut down manufacturing plant a lot of assets and some issues with the the building and the lease and the land floor so that was quite a bit of back and forth on the, the terms and negotiations around that acquisition we didn't acquire the company we just acquired the assets but um, nevertheless that was complicated um, what else I feel like a Oh yeah, we did, we did fundraising, we did private placement memorandum, that was a big one-time sunk cost, um, and um, have since then used them for other, you know, more generic term sheets and stuff as well. Um, I think that kind of covers most, I feel like there's definitely more, but they're not, I feel like I talked to them all, oh, I mean, even just commercial leases, that's another one that I, we we switched buildings several times. I always run my commercial leases past our attorney. And one thing I guess, you know, they talk about using different lawyers and law firms. We actually just use one, but it's a big one. Um, and that makes it a little bit more manageable. So our, sort of our company lawyer is really just a project manager, right? As a matter of fact, his specialty is irrelevant. It's banking litigation. And I hope to God we never need him for that. <laughs> I don't know why we would. But he's a, he's a member, you know, of the firm, and so he can just, he just finds the right person within that firm with the special specialty for whatever it is that we need. So that's how we we operate is just with one law firm, and then we find the right person in that law firm, and, and that's that's been you know pretty efficient. And of course, we don't pay the member uh, rate all the time either. We also have kind of one person to go to. Like he's he's really awesome, always very responsive, and he typically I think he's also in litigation. It's funny, so but he likes to divvy out what we need to different lawyers. Great, well thank you. Appreciate that, uh, those introductions and broad spectrum of uses for you know, attorneys. So I'd like to open it up now to the audience. Did you guys have any specific questions? Yes. So when you're interacting with your attorneys, what's the most frustrating thing you've encountered? The 
besides the cost. <laughs> Um, the, I mean, you know, by nature, you're anal, um, and that is good, but it can also be very challenging to get things done. Um, it's what you want, but you also want to get something over the goal line, and we do a lot of, like, management of our attorney, a lot of reviewing and even drafting of the stuff to help minimize that, uh, because otherwise you can end up with some language that's beyond the scope of the, of the need. So I think that's, I don't know, it's, it's just part of the process. I don't know, I guess, maybe it's not frustrating, but it's part of the process to pay attention to is, is really the management of the lawyer because they don't understand your business like you do, right? And so, and they understand just a generic legal framework. So it's really about connecting those dots. And so we spend a lot of time, you know, doing, you know, making sure that it's consistent with what the actual need is as opposed to what the 30 pages of documentation could look like, right? And there's other times where our lawyer has done the exact opposite. So you don't need, you don't need to spell it out like that. You actually are better off just writing this two paragraphs. So it does go both ways. So. I would say um, with any service provider, it's the lack of response. If I don't hear from you within 24 hours after me sending you an email, then I don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have hired an accounting firm due to this um, and a bank as well. Um, but my lawyers now, I love them. I mean, he's so responsive. And even if it's just a quick, like, hey, I got your message, I'm looking into it. Like, that is key to me. Um, the one thing I will say about one of our attorneys is he likes to, like, drag on on phone calls. And I'm like, am I being billed for this? Um, you know, just talking. Like, we've already kind of discussed what we needed to discuss. And that's fine. Like, I don't mind small talk. I just, I'm hoping he's not billing me for it. Um, the other thing that we manage our lawyers on, too, to make sure that costs don't get out of hand is uh, that example of the acquisition we did. Um, we bought this company from one lady who we were both like best friends at this point. So the, the document's gonna get signed. And I told the lawyers, I'm like, this is my budget for this acquisition. Like you are not to go back and forth with their lawyer like five times because I don't care about this one word. We're signing this document. Like, so I kind of had to manage it up front. Like, this is not a huge acquisition. It's a little mini thing. I'm sure you guys have done way bigger deals. Um, you know, both parties want to sign, so let's not get into this nitty gritty lawyer against lawyer, like poofing the feather thing. So we try to at least tell them up front what our budget is. Uh, yeah, I'll kind of echo what Jennifer has said. Being someone who, when you're starting a business, you have to be very responsive to your customers, otherwise they'll go to somebody else. And realizing that lawyers, I'm not their only client. Um, I get frustrated sometimes when maybe it takes a day or two for them to get back to me. I mean, when they get back to me, they're always thoughtful with their answers and whatnot. It's just, I sent you this thing, I want to know within minutes <laughs> after I sent you. That yeah, could, that's that could that's be just the, yeah, that, you know, <laughs> that could be a little bit of the personality of someone who can't work in a corporate environment if that's the <laughs> But, but that's, a, job, but that's the challenge of the entrepreneur. Like yeah. You're constantly in a dynamic environment. Yeah. So you really do need answers faster yeah. if possible because you don't know what's going to happen half the time in the next 24 hours. That's yeah. true. And I would say, too, I mean, the goal for you guys is to build a book of business. Like, we're tiny right now, yeah. you know, or when we started, but we're not planning to be. So the more responsive and upfront you can be on, like, the very tiniest startup, the more business they're going to give you. And I mean, my attorney can attest to that with all these projects that we've done with them. Thank you guys. Yep. Yes? How did you guys meet your attorneys? <laughs> uh, mine, mine was a family <laughs> of friends that I've known since I was a kid. And so that's, you know, just went with him because I trusted him. And he was at a big firm and could handle all the different things we needed. Um, the trademark, we used Middleton Root. Um, and I had known a girl there from like um, some women networking thing, so met her through that. Frost Brown Todd, our main one, um, there's a guy named Bill Strunch there, he's a partner, and he's like super in the entrepreneur community, so I mean, we all know who he is, you know, we know he's expensive, but you know, we can use people like our business and stuff, and so that's, that's how I got in touch with them. And then the Chinese law firm was just um, a recommendation from a consultant that I had. Yeah, so we use a small firm um, Fort Phelps, um, they're kind of a boutique shop. They mainly deal with business formation and fundraising. Um, so I, I had never heard of them. I sent an email to a couple of people I trusted and said, hey, I'm thinking about starting this thing. I want to talk to a law firm. Who do you guys recommend? 
that is not Bill Strange because I don't want to pay for Bill Strange right now. <laughs> uh, so that was one of the, a couple of um, recommendations came back. I talked to both of them. I had a, a horrible experience with one of them. I had a great experience with Fort Phelps, so I went to those guys. They've been great. Um, I originally used them when we were applying for our lending license in Kentucky. That's not their wheelhouse. Uh, we both kind of figured out pretty quickly next time I do this I'll use somebody else um, they were great they worked through things the best they could it just they didn't have a ton of experience in it they were reading the statute and trying to figure out what it said just like I was um, so um, that's when Dinsmore Scholl who is based who has an office in Lexington I am a client of theirs based on um, a fellowship program that I am in in Lexington um, also being fellowship um, we get five hours a month, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you give them very specific things to work on and say, this is what I want you to focus your five hours on this month, um, I'm kind of amazed at what they can get done um, and get back to me for five, um, in five hours uh, of work. Um, and then we've used, um, I'm drawing a blank on her name, a form based out of Indianapolis um, that have offices in Indianapolis, or in Indiana and Ohio because those are two states that we've considered um, applying for licenses in. Um, <clears throat> I apologize, I'm blanking on their name. Uh, but they were recommended by um, Dan Owen with Elevate Ventures, which is kind of a public-private partnership in Indiana, um, an investment arm. He was a mentor in a startup accelerator in Jeffersonville that we went through and he recommended those guys when we were talking about um, looking at Indiana. So um, pretty much everybody I've met has been either a recommendation or come as a service provider through a program that we've participated in. I'll say one thing that was a, a result of selecting a lawyer was we, like I said, I was a family friend and it's with Stites and Harbison. And one thing that I found is that because everybody knows the Stites and the Harbison name, we actually pass a lot of stuff really quickly. Like, um, like when we were raising money, you know, in our in our metadata on our documents, it obviously says who our accountants and lawyers and stuff are. And, and I bet I bet half the people didn't even bother to run it past their attorneys because because yeah. they basically said, "Oh, you're with Stites." Well, I'm not. I know this is all on the up and up. Yeah. And so I, I got that a lot. Or people, other people we dealt with use Stites, and they said, "Okay, well, I know it's on the up and up." So it's sort of an artifact that I never considered was that sort of name built-in trust and name recognition and while we probably pay a lot more um, at the end of the day we've also saved money because of that and um, a, a smaller less reputable firm may have not you know may have not had that same sort of name recognition been able to push things forward quickly uh, just on a trust basis yeah we've heard that I've heard that feedback from investors before don't use somebody I haven't heard of if you come in here with Bob's you know he runs a, a bail bond shop out of his law firm don't come in here with a term sheet that has that I've, I haven't heard of him, and I'm going to look him up, and I'm going to say this guy is not legitimate. He's not a serious person. The guy named Saul. Yeah, yeah, Saul. <laughs> better call Saul. Um, I love, love that show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I actually have two part question. If that's okay. Um, first, how often does it happen that you and your attorney have just a patent disagreement? And second, when and if that does happen. Um, what what usually is the result? <laughs> I, Did you say a patent? Just not. I meant like just a blatant disagreement where you and your like attorney completely disagree on what actually and say and what to do. Not not a you know not the intellectual property. Patent. So I <laughs> I founded the company solo, but have brought on a partner, and he's working on a, um, options agreement. So one of the things that we had to negotiate was that options agreement because you know we presented an options agreement that was um, I will say one-sided, but it was in Credit Fairy's best interest. Um, he took that to his law firm. The lawyers at one point were just going back and forth, sending red line stuff that, based on my understanding of what the language said, they were there were two versions of the same thing. And after about three times of that, I just said, "All right, you guys write something that works for us." knowing what they're going to send back and i just sent it i said this is the last time here it is deal with it um and some of that was a disagreement with my lawyers because they were like nah we got to remove it i was like I, I don't care how we either the shares are in percentages or they're in actual shares i don't really care it's, it's six one it does the other it's the same difference to me right um 
So it was little things like that where um, at the end of the day, the lawyer works for me. Um, I'm paying the bill. So, you know, all they can do is advise and say, this is what we think you should do. At the end of the day, it's my decision. Um, so I don't know if that's a disagreement. That's just, give me, I'm, I'm paying you for your opinion and, I, and then I'll choose to follow it or not. And then I will be the one who has to deal with the consequences after that. I have two sort of examples, the closest I have. Um, one was this cease and desist letter, whatever it's called. Like, I was just like, oh, just send me a template and I'll fill it out and like send it to the different folks. And he's like, no, you can't do that. Um, <laughs> we have to list out, you know, what exactly they're infringing on each time. And I'm like, well, can't I just make the draft because you know, I like to save money. So that was just one thing. I'm like, so every time I have to send it to someone, they're gonna have to like look at it and do it. Um, the other one is not related to cuddle clones. Uh, I had a little, si I have a little side project that I was working on involving NCAA licensing that I did have to involve an attorney on because I basically had started making products and shipping it before I had the license. And I thought I just had to have the license before I sold the product, but I didn't realize I had to have the license before bringing it into the country through customs. So we had a huge, this, this, I ended up agreeing with the lawyers, but it was a huge decision. We ended up having to destroy the goods like before they went through customs, which sucked. But it was a big back and forth on like, okay, here's option one, two, three, here's the possible ramifications of this, the fines that you might have to pay. And so in the end, I was like, okay, thank you. And it was, it was a huge like burden lifted off my back, but it was a pretty big decision that you know I could have gone the other way on against what the lawyers were talking about doing. Yeah, I don't know that we've ever had any disagreements per se. It comes down to communication and managing the process. Um, because in the end, they really want whatever we want, right? And they're just saying, how does it get papered, right? And so, <clears throat> I don't know how to paper it. I'm not a lawyer, right? So, um, you know, so I'm going to default to what they think is best. So most of the discussion is really more on strategy. Right? It's really more about what are the nuances we're trying to get out of this paper? You know, what is, what is my real high level objectives? And so the only real problems arise when, the, when you're not aligned and they don't get it, right? And so that's why I say you know, in the beginning that it's all, about, it's all about managing the process and communicating. And so, so we don't end up with disagreements, we just might end up with um, different views of what the communication was and you have to correct that but it's rare that they would, you know, there'd be like, I think I would never go to my lawyer and be like, you should write it this way because I don't, I don't know, you know. I mean, I know what my overarching goal is, but I don't know what, I don't know how to protect myself legally. That's up to him. I may have some constraints based on budgets and whatnot to where we can't just beat the hell out of this thing. But, uh, but usually I'm more concerned about protecting myself, my people, or my investors um, that in the end I'll let them keep going if they can they can tell me that no you really need to dot this i and cross this t or else then i'm usually going to go up and say okay i'm gonna side with you because that's why I'm, that's why i'm paying you and it's more more complicated or more cost than i want but most important is the protection so chris you had indicated earlier that at the beginning you had received two recommendations of potential firms to work with yeah. and one you ended up going with the other one they didn't align well. Could you maybe, without naming that firm, uh, uh, just um, talk a little bit about why you guys, why you, you wouldn't have chosen that other firm? What, what was what the uh, issues there? Yeah, so we had kind of a meet and greet call, and I, I just felt like he was um, vomiting words on me. Um, it wouldn't let me kind of speak to say, look, here's what I'm trying to do, here's what the business is. Now I need to be set up properly moving forward. Here's what the goals are, you know. We're not gonna raise money yet. We put a little money in. At some point, we will raise money. So you know, think about that when we're creating um, the structure for the business moving forward. And I just, I feel like he never gave me the opportunity to tell him what I needed. I feel like he just walked in and said, like he does everything the same way, and there was no flexibility or no sort of creative um, or critical thinking about what exactly my needs were. I, it was. The call probably lasted 25 minutes, and three minutes into it, I knew I was not going to hire the guy. Um, it just it, it started off bad from the get-go, and 
I was just happy it was on the phone and not in person. Because <laughs> I my, my facial expressions tend to and I'm not good at hiding what I'm thinking <laughs> a lot of times. So but that was yeah, it was it was pretty clear that Nathan and Andrew, we just kind of had a much better feel for each other, and they were a much better fit, um, personality-wise. Yeah, Jennifer, you, you mentioned something that made me uh, uh, think about uh, one thing that uh, a law professor I had went to my classes, uh, I think it was contracts, where it was, you pay me now or pay me later, pay me later, it's more expensive. Were there, were there experiences where you entered into, uh, or you, you undertook a transaction or what have you, and in retrospect, you wish you had spoken to the lawyer in advance? I, I ask this because you mentioned about the stockholder, the investor that ended up passing away, and there was nothing in the agreement to deal with that circumstance, something that I think we talked about in our classes all the time, how to help entrepreneurs avoid those kinds of circumstances by drafting in advance the, the, the bad outcome that you don't want to talk about when you start up a Yeah, and you know, when, when we, I mean, I guess it's a classic thing where, you know, we'll read through a contract and be like, yeah, it sounds good. And then there's only an issue and there's a problem. And then the contract, you end up, it's, oh, it's missing things. Um, we have not, I mean, we ended up doing something pretty reasonable. And we just offered the guy, the state people, like the value of the shares. and. We didn't necessarily have a business valuation, but at the time we entered into the consulting agreement with this person, he got a certain number of his hours in cash and a certain number in shares, and they were valued at that time. So we ended up just saying, okay, you had ended up earning X shares, here's the cash value of those. You know, you can either keep the shares or you can take this payout. And so we ended up taking the payout. So that was reasonable. I mean, there was not really anything in the contract that said we could do that. Um, but you know, we figured it was a pretty fair offer. Um, yeah, there was nothing that said we couldn't offer that. Um, and then the other one where we had gone after the vendor, I don't think that could have been avoided by any service agreement or anything. It was just a, a web development company that just, you know, previous life took I us over the, the same web development the coals. Company, so. yeah. um, and you know, it was just a huge. They didn't deliver what they should have um, in the scope document. So, I mean, it was as simple as that. Like, so, um, yeah, there's no sort of huge pay now for anything, and then later we find out it wasn't that great. So we've been pretty lucky, I guess. I have a, almost a reverse of that, um, which is when we acquired uh, all those assets from the company, they, we had to go into a non compete. And, um, uh, you know, of course, the, the lawyer actually thought the non-compete was fine, and uh, it's an issue where I actually paid him now because I didn't want to pay him later. And, but he didn't realize that because he didn't understand the business, right? And so I had to be the one that really pushed on the non-compete to get more and more language in there to, uh, although it was more and more language, it actually freed us more. It more narrowly defined, you know, what was being in the non-compete such that we could operate more freely in other ranges. So I actually had to push him to do more now when he was just kind of like, oh, I think it's fine. You know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, but so it's a little bit the opposite, yeah. but uh, keeping that in mind. We hear often that, you know, with uh, online forms and people just go on, you know, you don't need a lawyer anymore. You just find the form online, fill in the blanks, and everything's great. Uh, I was just wondering if your perception of that is has changed from having, you know, done transactions over the years. And in fact, sometimes you can, things fall through the cracks that you don't, you're not aware of because you're not a lawyer, and so therefore it would have made more sense to talk to somebody up front. Yeah, I, our first loan agreement, terms of service, privacy policy, um, were ripped off of Prosper's website. Um, I did a seek and find on Prosper, replaced it with Credit Fairy, read through it, <laughs> had someone that I knew that worked in compliance and banking read it, and he said, yeah, I think this gets it. <laughs> and we rolled with it. Um, so the first 50 loans we made were based on those legal agreements that were written for somebody else's business. Because, um, you know, it, 
at some point you just got to get something out there and see does anybody even want to buy this damn thing because i'm not going to spend five thousand dollars on lawyers writing up an agreement that nobody will ever sign um we have now gone back and had uh law firms review those things um we passed our first state examination so it didn't it hasn't come back to bite us yet um did they change a lot they yeah, it's probably three or four pages longer now. Than it was. <laughs> like we had nothing in there around the USA Patriot Act. We had nothing in there around some other stuff. There were just, and I don't know that they necessarily apply that much to our business because um, we're not dealing large dollar amounts. But it's just stuff that, you know, is kind of a CYA. Um, so uh, you know, we we didn't go to like legal zoom and, and come up with a legal contract. I just stole somebody else's and. Um, repurposed it but yeah all that stuff has been updated and amended now um, and there will be other things that we'll figure out like we we learned early on when we started the stuff that had, we've defaulted on that were folks didn't pay when we started sending that to collections we didn't have any language in our contract where you could put somebody on an automated dialer because to put someone on an automated is anybody ever working in a call center so they have, there's two ways you can call from a call center. You can pick up the phone and smile and dial, or they have these systems that will automate the calling for you, and it makes it much more efficient, and it knows what time zone you live in, it knows how responsive you've been to answering the phone previously, and it's kind of smart. Uh, well, you have to get someone's permission when you're trying to collect on a debt to put them on that, um, and sending it to, no one's ever going to give a collector and say, yes, please call me five times a day. Um, so adding that language into the legal agreement, once they sign it, They've given their consent that they can be put on that once we send them to collect. And so it's just like that was something that until I talked to a collector and the collector saw my agreement, they said, "Here are the things we need you to change for us." I, I, and I don't know that. And the lawyers never came back and said anything about that either. I had to ask the lawyer. I had to say, "I need this added. Make sure that it protects me." Um, so you know, I, some of that's just you know, you learn as you go, figure things out. And there's always going to be unforeseen things, I guess, you know, and, and it's like you, how much, how far do you go in the first wave? Because you can just sort of infinitely project different scenarios, right? And and at some point, you know, like the one you're talking about, I mean, you know, how, how, how many variations of the shareholder death could you have envisioned and how it might go? So I think at some point you have to know that there is going to be expenses later on. Like we, our, our, our private place of memorandum contemplated a series of raises and the preferences with the unit sales were associated kind of with what we thought the rest of the raises were going to be well now the raises aren't going to be like that and now we're going back and actually just in the last couple of weeks are reviewing what the hell we wrote and being like can, you know what happens when we make this change that we didn't contemplate doing before but you can't plan for everything right and so it's a simple solution it's a one-page document we have to circulate and get everybody, you know, in the that bought those shares to sign off on. So it's not that big a deal. But we, you know, how do you? You can't line out everything up front. Other questions, big comments. How long did you guys operate before you sought uh, investors and before you had to go get a PPM? We formed all our LLC while still in school. So that was 2010. of those years though we're basically just paying consultants to help us figure out a way to manufacture our product um, so we weren't really selling anything yet um, it was more just research and development for two years um, and then it was funny because in China we actually were operating our workshop well before we had the legal entity <laughs> uh, I just flew there for a month and we hired some people in the office street. They were plush designers, but basically hired them. They came in, there were like six people the first day, and I had a designer, and we bought a few sewing machines, and I personally signed a lease on a building in China. I mean, I have no idea. Like, they couldn't come after me here, I'm pretty sure, if I had defaulted on that, but whatever. The guy was fine with it. We had like a nice little picture of us like shaking hands. Um, but at that point, you know, it was just me. And 
So we started working at the same time as applying for this wholly foreign owned enterprise and it took a good seven or eight months. And so we were already ready to start selling. So that was like early 2013 and I don't think we had the official Chinese business registration until like October. So, but no one ever seemed to really have a problem with it. I mean, I don't, we didn't get into any trouble really with the government, but we probably should have done that first, but it Are worked out. with your investors? No. I don't think any of them really understood what we were doing over there. We're just like, yeah, we're applying for the business license over there. We're making some product. And I don't necessarily know if it was illegal. I mean, we had we had shared some space with another workshop, so we probably could have said like, oh, hey, you know, we're doing work with this workshop or something. So it's not as bad as I make it sound. I hope. <laughs> but you know, it's interesting question to ask because I, I think it's wholly dependent on your business, right? So, I mean, uh, we, we're all probably going to have different stories, whether that's relevant to what anybody in this room is trying to do, I don't know. I mean, our com our current company is like a spinoff from another company, and we transferred IP over and uh, to, to move from sort of R&D into manufacturing, and we operated the current company for about eight months before raising capital, but we had another income stream. Um, so we didn't do the, the PPM until we needed the money to take it to the next level of expansion in the business, but we had an income stream. So, you know, so six months, but we've been in the space for several years in the other business. Yeah, so we haven't done, I guess, an official fundraise yet. Most of what we've done has been friends and family. So um, we use the, the operating agreement was the, is what governs my ownership of the company, um, the money that I put in. Um, and the other equity pieces we have are warrants, essentially, where um, someone owns a piece of the company that they can exercise at a later, at a later date or based on some triggering action. Um, so um, that warrant agreement is, I think it's a two-page document. Um, it's pretty simple. Um, we've got another... Um, uh, option agreement that uh, the states, can, the Kentucky Science and Technology Corporation owns or has the opportunity to own a piece of credit ferry at our at a qualifying fundraise and that is a, a template that was created by um, one of the founders of Techstars. It's out on the internet. They use it. It was fine with me. Um, I had seen the document before so we haven't done a PPM. We haven't done an official sort of seed round or series A round yet. We're gearing up for that, so we will be um, working on that. But we've been in business since 2015 and been making loans since December of 2015. So, um, and really haven't raised any significant capital yet. Speaking of tech stars and the other sort of business <coughs> incubators out there, I think like somebody from Y Combinator, um, there, there's a couple like a little more simple funding tools out there now. So I don't know mm -hmm. if you guys are familiar with that, but there's one called KISS and one called SAFE, and they're like really yeah. quick documents to get some investment money. It's kind of a convertible note situation, yeah. but that's something you guys might want to look into as lawyers helping people with fundraising, or sort of the, the vehicles that are, be, that are out there that are becoming simpler for people to get money from investors. That Our agreement and then with the, KSTC is with KISS. Okay. Um, that and then the whole equity crowdfunding stuff that's been legalized now as well. We, none of us, I don't think any of us have done any of that, but it's just something that's out there now. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, we've been talking about private placement memorandums, but, um, you know, our, you know, we told, you know, we went to our attorney and said, we're going to do a private placement memorandum. We're going to fundraise this way. Um, arguably, that's not uh, the most popular way to raise money right now. Um, there's a lot of other versions, and I think that's one thing that like our attorneys couldn't really help, they couldn't really say what's on market, you know, what type of structure for the fundraising is what you would expect to get traction with, right? I mean, there are people that just vomit in their mouth if I hand them a PPM, right? I mean, they just be like, oh, I'm not, I don't want to deal with you, right? You know, you don't give me the terms, I give you the terms. And so you have to know who you're going to go, where, how you're going to raise money, you know, who, what type of people you're going to raise money from, and how much, and what, what do you want to give up, and what's the structure, all that. And that really dictates the, uh, the mechanism, the vehicle for the fundraising. And, 
and I got a lot of pushback on the PPM, but we just stuck to our guns and said, well, too bad, you know, I mean, you're not the type of person we want to deal with if you don't want to operate under this type of, of a document. Um, and it took us a lot longer to raise money because we didn't do something that was more vanilla, you know, or on market or all those catchphrases, all the, you know, entrepreneur superstars want to throw at you. At the end of the day, you just you just got to decide what's best for your company and your, your attorney can help you with that, but they don't know your business. And they may have, they may have helped, they may have drafted 500 agreements or, you know, to go and raise money, but none of those was your company, you know? So that's where I come back to saying it's very important that you know your company and you help them understand that so that you create the proper way to do that. And it's wholly dependent on what you're trying to do. And everybody's gonna have an opinion, right? Everybody has an opinion uh, on what you should do and you have to just find the right way. Um, so I don't wanna, because we, because we've been saying PPM so yeah. much, I think it's good to point out that there are a lot of different ways to raise money and it's just depends on what you're trying to do and who you're trying to get money from. And when that should happen is a part of that as well. Uh, or one vehicle's better at different stages, right? I mean, if you don't know what your business is worth, you're not gonna do a PPM, right? I mean, you just you just really can't. You have to use a different, you know, convertible note with a cap or something. I mean, there's, you, you have to know your business and know what you're trying to do to find that right vehicle. And I will admit that when we did our PPM, I didn't really know about Which is traditional. I mean, in, in the 90s, yeah. that would have been every everybody, right? But now there's much more, obviously, because of the empowerment of the entrepreneur and yes. the sexiness of it. <laughs> yeah, so now they've created all these additional ways to make money off of you. So in that situation, is that something you would have liked your attorney to offer you? Uh, these are Here are different options for you to consider, sort of pros and cons of each, or do you think that that was sort of a, a, your responsibility to have done your homework and research and figured that out up front? I wouldn't I think, Yeah, go ahead. I, I, my, you know, we, we use a suite of attorneys. I suppose if you went to one of the people they were talking about, they could help you better understand what the market wants to see and the place you're going, but I'd say that is not the norm. I'd say most attorneys may have done 20 different versions, but you know, you wouldn't go to them, you would go to your advisor, your consultant who has helped other companies raise money. I think that you would, I think there's somebody else that would fill that role, and no offense, but the attorney's a tool, and they need, you know, they, they may be able to do any one of those different things, but you know you really need to know where you're going. And I think that's a role for somebody else. We use you know we have financial consultants and whatnot that have raised money before and said this is what you're trying to do, this is the way you should do it. Then you go to the attorney and the attorney says that's fine, you know, no problem. I've done 50 of these, no big deal. But I, I think if you have one that is ingrained in that process, then they can probably provide that support. But if you're but there's probably not that many of those guys around. I will take a different route on the answer. I would have liked my attorney to tell me that there were different vehicles. At least tell me there were some out there. And I'll be like, okay, thanks, I'll research it. And then I'll come back to you. But at least saying like, yeah, you might want to research this and this and this. And I would have probably asked Bill Strench about that. Like at one of our meetings, you know, in passing, like at Venture Connectors or something. Like, hey, what's out there? So I do expect my attorney to be up to speed on what is available and what is best for me. Um, yes, they have to draft the documents and understand the legalities of all those formations, but I do want that extra step from my attorney. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to educate myself as much as possible before I ask my attorney for anything. Because if, if, if what they tell me is completely off the wall and it's nothing that I've found on Google, then I'm going to have a question like, okay, well, why are you going with that? Because I've been researching this a little and here are the things that I've seen that are typical. Why, is, why are you advocating for something different and he may have a perfectly good reason and that's fine but I, I I don't ever like to ask someone a question where I'm totally ignorant about it um, unless it's a doctor I guess <laughs> I think there's two types of entrepreneurs too there's the, the ones yeah. that don't know anything and they're like oh my god take care of this yeah and then there's maybe the ones like us like if I'm reading you know I'm reading something about the angel investment act Kentucky and it's like oh refer to KRS section da, yeah. da, da. I'll go look up the law and yeah. read it and I'll be like, hmm, okay, here's what I think this says. And then I'll like send a little snippet to the lawyer and be like, hey, here's what I think this says. Could I do this? <laughs> um, so I think there's definitely different types of entrepreneurs. There's the ones that don't do the research and there's the ones that do. It's all about, I kind of say this again, it's all about managing the process though. I mean, 
at the end of the day, they're going to respond to whatever you ask them for. Mm -hmm. So if you go to them and say, I want you yeah. to write a PPM for me, you're not asking them, can you tell me what the different vehicles are? So right. if, you know, so it's a lot of, just like any other interaction with any other service mm -hmm. provider, any other, any other employee, employee, by God, um, you know, no, but it's very rare that that people really step outside of the ex, you know the explicit conversation, and so that's why, as as particularly as entrepreneurs, you have to sort of think about everything because nobody else is right. They're all just sort of like, "What are you telling me?" Okay, I'll go do that. And it's not that anybody's not trying to be supportive; it's that they have fifty other things they're doing too, and you know, so they're not really trying to be like. So you know, I'm really trying to think about the fifty things that might imp, you know have an implication on this decision, unless you really ask that question. What are the ten different ways? I this is where I'm headed. What are the, what are ten other options? And so, um, who you ask that question of, though, you know, I think it depends. The content of the question drives who the person you should ask that question of. Um, and if you're just blanketly to go to your attorney and say, "I want to raise money," what are there different vehicles? And if they can't tell you fifteen of them, then you got a problem. Right? Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean they can help you find the one that's right for you. And then how you find the answer to the one that's right for you may be researching it on your own, and maybe reaching reaching out to another resource. So you guys have highlighted several characteristics of attorneys that you focus on when you're looking to engage an attorney. One of those would be responsiveness. Another one would be willingness to actually you know, sit down and listen and understand my situation. Um, and then you've also indicated that the uh, majority, at least two of the three, I think Trey probably as well, does, uh, oh, no, you have said that as well. You do some of the work up front to help minimize your cost. If you're looking to engage an attorney other than those three there, what are characteristics that would either draw you to an attorney or turn you away completely? Any other characteristics? Uh, I rely on people that I know, that I trust, that have been through the process before, and I would I don't want to say lean, but if they made a recommendation to someone, that would at least make me give them a look. Um, and, you know, I might ask a few other people, have, have you guys worked with these guys? If not, have you heard anything bad about them um, or good? Um, I like to kind of get a feel for what people I trust think about service providers, so it's probably a lot of word now. Um, with me. The other one, I guess, is expertise. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that wasn't really put in there but like I don't know I was I think about this uh, optometrist commercial I heard on the radio the other day I think it was for LASIK right and they started you know they said oh Dr. Joe Schmo he's done you know come we got a big deal you get a LASIK for like a hundred bucks and you're like oh my god a hundred bucks but I've done 250,000 of them right and so I, I think that there's also an expertise thing that you're not just grabbing some random even if it is a recommendation mm -hmm. you get comfortable with that recommendation but you want to make sure that they have an expertise in the subject matter and then one that's an intangible that I probably wouldn't make a decision around, but it's useful is, is just is networking. Um, you know, as business people in the community and professionals, uh, the attorney can be pretty helpful in networking to other, not to other attorneys, but to other business people in the, um, in the area or even outside the area. We've had a couple of, you know, good things for the company happen just because our attorney knew somebody who knew somebody. Whatever. So that's actually, maybe a decision making, but very useful piece. I would only, I agree with both of those. I would only add that I'm kind of getting used to the big firm that has a lot of departments. So, you know, I only have to put one firm in my bill pay on pay. So <laughs> it's nice. Like, so, oh, hey, mergers and acquisitions, same law firm. So I'm kind of used to that. But so I guess it's the breadth of the services that they provide. But that does not mean that I will not use a small law firm if they provide the service level. questions so at what point have you guys ever thought about the prospect of bringing an attorney in-house or are you very comfortable with just doing all of this outsourcing or where would you need to you know to what level of growth would you need to achieve what level of growth would you need to achieve before you would consider bringing an attorney in-house or do you feel that maybe you're, you have such a spectrum of, of needs that it wouldn't make sense to do that I think the latter for me I mean, foresee ever bringing an attorney in-house. <laughs> I mean, maybe I'm not thinking big enough, but even if we were a huge company, I don't 
really think that our legal needs are that huge, or you know, one person to cover all of the different aspects. Yeah, I think we, I don't, I don't know what the revenue number would be, but it'd be, <laughs> it'd be a big number. And yeah, <laughs> and it would be, you know, yeah, it would be sort of funneling towards sort of more, more regular event, you know, things that we have to cover, not such a diversity of things. But I will say that, you know, our attorney also agreed to be on our advisory board. And so um, we can, you know, so it's a bit of a marketing gimmick, but it, you know, it almost looks like we have an attorney on our team, you know, like as part of our team is and not an employee, but very integrated into our company. And so when we go out and present, here's our team, he's on there as a member of our advisory board. And so I think we do get some, you know, some traction in some, you know, view of us as being professionals because we have a, a professional. It's one thing to say that we've employed Stites and Harbison. It's another thing to say that, you know, Rick Vance, a member of Stites and Harbison, is a member of our advisory board. And so that goes a long way in just showing more professionalism, I think. It didn't cost us anything, right? He was like, yeah, sure, just throw, here's my bio, you know? Um, I think for you, I, yeah, it'll be different for me. Might, yeah. I operate in a highly regulated market. Um, we have federal statutes that we have to comply with. We have state statutes that we will have to comply with. So whether it will be someone who's an actual lawyer or someone who's just worked in banking and lending compliance, that will be one of our earliest hires. Um, because I've read uh, enough state statutes for lending uh, for a lifetime, I don't care to read another one. Um, so I would, that is one thing that I am eager to offload um, for a variety of reasons. One, I don't want to do it, and I'm not an expert in it. So I probably come at it from a different perspective. We will need in-house um, expertise. What that looks like, um, I'm not entirely sure. We may have an in-house lawyer. Or something. So if there are no other questions, any final words of wisdom you might impart on people considering being uh, attorneys, working with entrepreneurs, <coughs> anything they should be aware of, any special features you feel entrepreneurs have that they may not uh, uh, encounter if they work with uh, uh, more established companies? Uh, good luck. I don't know that we're an easy lot to... <laughs> Uh, I would say if you're if you are interested in working with entrepreneurs, definitely start the networking now. Like go to Venture Connectors, go to the entrepreneur events in Louisville, go watch Cardinal Challenge, the big business plan competition that was last weekend here on Fiat, or I guess it was at Marriott downtown. Um, you know, just start making those connections and friends because you know you never know when somebody you meet is actually going to finally go forward with their business and say, oh my gosh, I totally remember meeting that law student or whatever, maybe they're a lawyer now. So I don't know, like they always say too, like for us, before we wanna raise money to like start networking like a year before we're ready to raise money because you have those relationships and stuff, so. Well, I'd say if, if any of you are getting law degrees and wanna be entrepreneurs yourself, then you probably stand to save some money. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, you're gonna have an easier entry into entrepreneurism. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well with that, please join me in thanking our panelists.